So while we're trying to get this pulled up here, I'd like to ask a simple question. If anybody could please identify for me the largest service industry in the world. Any guesses? Food? Tourism? U.S. healthcare system. U.S. healthcare system is a service industry. And whether we want to refer to that or not in those terms, there's no misgivings, it's a service industry. Next slide, please. Maybe. As we enter into an era of value-based healthcare, I think it's important to recognize that while the quality and the cost components of value have been studied, reviewed, debated, less emphasis has been given to the service component of the value-based healthcare equation. So when I think about service um, in healthcare, what I really am more focused on is the patient experience. And somewhere along the way, that's taken a back seat to the quality and cost variables. Interestingly, when you ask people to define patient experience, you get a number of different responses. My mom recently went to a cardiologist. She had waited several months to get an appointment. She was there, very well-respected cardiologist. And, uh, and I said, well, how was your visit? She said, it was fine. I said, well, what did, what did you think about it? And she said, well, there was a dead plant in the waiting area. <laughs> and I said, who cares? And she said, well, you don't understand. If this cardiologist cannot keep a plant alive, how can he possibly keep my heart beating? And so what I think we have to recognize is that really the patient experience is ultimately the sum total of all interactions. It's not just the patient and the physician face-to-face -face time sitting in a room creating that sacred bond. And I once believed that that was the case, that I was really, truly the patient experience. But it's not. It's the sum total of everything. It's all of the interactions that you have with patients, that your staff have with patients, the entirety of the healthcare system. And it's ultimately largely shaped by the culture of your organization. And that's really where I wanted to put my emphasis today. So the Barrel Institute, which is an institute that's really focused on patient experience, did a study in 2017, and they identified some key factors that were the primary drivers of patient experience. And they identified across all care domains two variables that carried the most weight. And from 2015 to 2017, these two variables skyrocketed. Number one, highly engaged staff. Number two, a strong and positive workplace culture. I'm in practice, in private practice, in a uh, single specialty, seven physician, ear, nose, and throat group with two PAs in Western North Carolina. And I recently came into a leadership position, and I recognized that if I wanted to be one, a major strategic objective of mine was to really drive the patient experience that those are the two factors that I was going to have to focus on and put increased emphasis on. Employee engagement and our organizational culture. And what I had really identified is that, this is actually fun with no slides, by the way. What I had really identified, ultimately, was that in order for our practice to move forward, we really needed to look backwards. Simon Sinek would say that when an organization first begins, its why purpose and its what, how they do it, are linked. At time point zero, those lines are aligned and they're in parallel. The people who are there know why they do it and what they're doing. And as success goes up and time goes on, there becomes this split, where more and more people enter the organization through natural growth and scale, more and more people enter into the organization who may know what they do, but fewer and fewer people in that organization still know why they do it. And so it requires effort to revisit your beliefs. It requires effort to focus on your organizational culture. And so recognizing that I wanted our practice to be at the forefront of value-based healthcare and that the service component is critically important, and that the service component is, I'm good, actually. 
we'll just turn them off, that the service component is largely based on your organization's culture, the degree of your employees' engagement, driving the patient experience in value-focused healthcare, that I thought it was pertinent that we start by redefining our beliefs and revisiting our organization's mission, vision, and values. Because if you don't apply strategy to that, just like you would any other aspect of your organization, it's going to evolve without you. So, this has been well described by leading organizations. How do you wrap your hands around the patient experience to drive your employee engagement, to drive your organizational change, and Service Fanatics, a book by James Merlina, who, who details the Cleveland Clinic experience, really was something that helped guide my thought process. But we don't have 35,000 employees. We don't have a chief experience officer. We don't have any of the resources that I feel are necessary, or I thought were necessary, to do that. So my project was really to try to define four primary steps that I felt were necessary to reestablish our organization's culture, drive our employee engagement, improve our patient experience, and then ultimately measure, review, report, and react to our results. And so the first thing is you need to, you need to identify that there's a need. And for me, there was a need. I was coming into a leadership position, and I said, this is a really important strategic initiative to me. And so the reality is, anytime in change management, it has to be, to some degree, initiated at the top. Not done by the top, initiated by at the top for both a top-down and bottom-up approach. And so I did that. I started to surround myself with people and develop a, a small group of early adopters who also were like-minded in this. And I had them buy into this concept, which is that Sometimes our, our thinking is backwards. Sometimes we take our results, and then we've justified our actions, and then we go backwards on this circle and we say, oh, and that's why I believe what I believe. And what we really need to do is the exact opposite. What we really need to do is be intentional about our beliefs, because ultimately that's what drives our actions, and that's what drives our results, not the other way around. So there's a little bit of early buy-in that started in late October of last year. And I said, well, now we really actually need a team to, to sort of start to do something. And uh, anytime you have a belief, the most important way to be able to share that with someone is to be able to articulate it. And so you have to have a shared common vocabulary. So this was our war room, which is our um, upstairs lobby in our building. And uh, three physicians and 13 members of our uh, 80 employee organization met. And through a series of really thought-provoking exercises, we came up with four words that we defined as pillars for our organization. And we used those to redefine our beliefs. And the thing that was really interesting to me in this process, one, I was really um, amazed at the people that had been there far longer than I had and I was tapping into their memory of what it was like at time point zero for this practice. But really the amazing thing that came out of this is once you develop a vocabulary that supports your belief and you start to use that, it actually takes on new life. There is a shared common vocabulary of being able to put your thoughts and beliefs into words. And from that, you can start to see action unfold. But really the focus of this was, again, I wanted to, I'm focused on patient experience, so I need engaged employees. Well, now maybe we actually have a, a, a shared common vocabulary and a developing a stronger organizational culture that they can actually be engaged to. And so looking at sort of a basic hierarchy of needs, and this is from Maslow's paper in 1943, you know, you've got your basic needs of safety and water and shelter, and I think we had those covered. But ultimately, if I want to get the most out of people, if I want them to be at their best, they need to be completely self-fulfilled. They need to be at the top of the pyramid. And only there, at the top of the pyramid, will they perform purely altruistic acts like watering a dead plant without being told you need to water a dead plant. 
And so it starts with some foundational needs of belongingness and love. I mean, these are, these are innate human needs. And so we developed a series of tactics to support that, new mentorship programs. So as new people came into the organization, they were paired with other people in the organization that had been there forever, that understood the why purpose of the organization. And this wasn't just, well, you're a front desk person, so you're matched up with a front desk person. This is you're a front desk person, so you're matched up with someone in a completely different department who's been here forever and understands the heartbeat of the practice. We went through interesting book clubs about dysfunctional teams. We developed structured leadership training. We started hiring for fit. We no longer looked at people for ability only. We looked at them for their attitude and ones that are consistent with the mission, vision, and values. And this is critically important, especially now, where you have a millennial workforce that is the predominant workforce in the United States who are more focused on where they derive purpose from their work than what they are doing. We developed wellness and, happiness, wellness and happiness programs to support some of these other needs. Water challenges, community sponsored 5Ks, and tried to promote a culture of fun. Probably the most critical thing that I could share with you guys is the power of developing peer recognition programs. There is nothing stronger than a peer recognizing someone else. They don't even care if the physicians recognize them. If their coworker recognizes them, that is the most powerful thing that I had seen evolve over the last several months. We developed brag boards, which are literally boards that people post like notes on it, like, hey, Carmen, you were awesome, and we put it where patients can see it. Monthly practice newsletters, celebrating work anniversaries, developing pathways for people to carry their altruistic desires beyond the four walls of our practice. And so these seem like a lot of little things. Well, you did a little bit of this, and you did a little bit of this, and a little bit of this. And yeah, we did, because that's exactly what it takes. It's a little bit of everything. You don't just go from saying this is what we believe and be connected to it and take care of patients. And it's something that evolves and develops over time. And you have to, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we had to measure this in some way. And I think this was another key point. We wanted to review, reflect, and report upon our, our successes. So we've started to review our results, and we've started to create this as a key performance indicator of our organization. What are our point engagement scores, and what are our patient SAT scores? And the patient SAT scores, yeah, that's part of it. I think that's ingrained in a lot of organizations. But what are our employee engagement scores? Because ultimately, I'm using that now as one of the vital signs of our practice. That is a leading indicator of the health of our practice. So we adopted five questions from the Gallup Q12 questionnaire, and these five questions have been linked between employee engagement and um, inpatient satisfaction scores. And so I had had the opportunity at the, at the sort of the onset of this practice, again, we met with some initial foundational work in December of 2018, put some of these programs in place, had a baseline uh, set of these questions. Um, asked, and then seven, about seven months later, after some of these programs had been in place, asked them on those five domains, uh, ranked in a, in a Likert scale. And none of them showed any statistically significant difference. So disappointing, but very telling, and I'm going to get to that in a second. As far as our patient satisfaction scores, tons of ways to measure patient satisfaction, I'm sorry, patient experience. Some of those are patient satisfaction scores. The one I like the most is the net promoter score because it's a distilled version that basically just measures loyalty. And because Google and Apple use it, I thought it was pretty good. And so what we saw with that is that um, our net promoter score in general increased over time but did not achieve statistically significant difference. And so you could easily be discouraged by these results but you're talking about changing the heart and minds of individuals, and I'll finish on these last two points. You're, you're talking about changing the mar hearts and minds of individuals, and we know that you're changing the way they think and they view in some ways themselves, and that that thought process is not one that occurs easily for everybody. And so we were on the left hand and still are on the left hand side of the curve. There's no doubt about it. But what we recognize is that once you reach a tipping point, which is about 18% of your organization, that's when adoption really starts to skyrocket. 
And so the results may not be measurable first, but we still celebrated our short-term and interval uh, wins, and I'm certain we're going to get there in the future. And so in order to look at the results that we want, which is to be at the forefront of value-focused healthcare, we need a strong, uh, we've developed a stronger organizational culture. We've made efforts to further engage our employees to fuel the patient experience to support that, um, that desire. Last sentence, and I am going to read a slide. Caring for those supporting the delivery of care and reaffirming a connection of purpose is absolutely fundamental to the successful realization of a positive patient experience. Thank you. <laughs>